painting promised to, promises to be a revealing conversation about the work of American Playhouse, which is this unique film and video production company. Um, we will also talk about the achievements of African American filmmakers in general, as well as their work with American Playhouse. And we have the honor of um, having one of those filmmakers with us on stage tonight. Um, the Playhouse tribute will continue next week, next Friday, June 18th, with a local premiere of a new film called Shimmer, and director John Hansen will be on hand to introduce the film and also have a Q&A with the audience. Um, before anything, I would just like to thank a few people who helped us make this evening and this tribute possible. John Stout and Sandra Schulberg, who provided programming assistance for us. Nick Gottlieb and Julia Strom of American Playhouse, who assisted us with just materials on Playhouse and the materials of this, the clips that we're going to be showing tonight. Um, the MacArthur Foundation and the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for their financial support. And most of all, to the Juneteenth co-sponsors, I will not have the time to name all of them, but we have them listed in the back of the brochure. I'd like to thank all of them um, for pulling the resources, the limited resources that we, that we have in the community to, to bring in Julie Dash and to make this evening of film events and tomorrow's workshop possible. Um, I'd now like to introduce to you one of the key people who um, and organizers of the Juneteenth Film Festival, who is a local filmmaker and is actually the chair of the Juneteenth Film Festival. Please welcome Mr. DeJunius Hughes. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out this evening um, to hear Julie Dash and uh, Lindsay Law. Um, <clears throat> as Marlena said, I'm the chair of the Juneteenth Film Festival. Um, actually, I came on board uh, in 1991. Uh, I got in Minneapolis in 1990, and I came with an agenda. I knew Ursi and Michael Cheney I had met them the year before, came up to do some shooting on Juneteenth, and uh, when I moved here, Ursi asked me to be on the steering committee. And uh, I immediately knew what I wanted to do, and that was to uh, bring a black film festival uh, to Juneteenth celebration, which I did. I wrote a uh, grant to the Minneapolis Arts Commission and received it, and we... Uh, put on a film festival in 1991. Last year I was out of the city uh, on a fellowship, but uh, the festival continued. Uh, they wrote a grant, got another grant from the Minneapolis Arts Commission, which helped, and put on a festival last year. Uh, I got back in town just for the end of it. And this year we're, we're very pleased to be able to bring uh, Julian, uh, I think it's important that uh, Juneteenth uh, continue this film festival. I would like to see it grow even into a week or even two weeks eventually because there are an abundance of uh, independent black filmmakers in this country, especially women, who are doing incredible films. And I think uh, the Twin City uh, area should be uh, privy to seeing a lot of these films. And if I have anything to do with it, you will. Uh, <clears throat> Marlena mentioned some of the sponsors. Uh, it's a long list, um, and it is on the back of your uh, brochure here. So. At this point, I would just like to introduce to you um, Valerie Royal. She's a member of the National Council of Negro Women. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Juneteenth and why we celebrate this. Um, slavery was officially abolished in 1863 with the enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation. 
However, slaves in the state of Texas did not know of their freedom until June of 1865, some two and a half years later. Even though President Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves in the states that tried to secede from the Union, slave owners chose to keep the news to themselves. It wasn't until Union troops arrived in Galveston that slaves in Texas learned of their freedom. That day, June 19th, and the days surrounding are known as Juneteenth and have been celebrated in Texas for 128 years. Since then, renewed awareness and interest in African American history has prompted more cities to adopt Juneteenth as a day of celebration, unity, and remembrance. Minneapolis has joined cities across the nation in sponsoring J-Day events. Some of the events that you will be made aware of, and you can check your yellow flyer, will be symposiums that are going to be held within the coming week. Um, the titles of some of those are The History of Racism, Adult Children of Recovering Slaves, and No More Shame. Also, there will be some events taking place throughout the rest of this weekend in conjunction with the film festival, which you'll find in the green flyer, which should be included with this. And those will be a filmmaker workshop with Julie Dash taking place tomorrow at Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and also a screening of A Question of Color by Kathy Sandler, which takes place on Sunday here at the Walker Art Center. The Juneteenth Steering Committee invites you to join us for the eighth annual Juneteenth celebration. And tonight, we bring you the first of a three-day film festival featuring the works of African-American women. And now Marlena will introduce our guests. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce the two guests of honor for tonight. Lindsay Law is the president and executive producer of American Playhouse. He has produced such films as Daughters of the Dust, Straight Out of Brooklyn, A Raisin in the Sun, The Thin Blue Line, among others. He's also the executive producer of the two new features which are being featured through this tribute, um, Philip Haas's Music of Chance and John Hansen's Shimmer. Julie Dash is the African-American woman filmmaker who astounded audiences around the country and in, and in other countries around the globe with her remarkable first feature-length film, Daughters of the Dust. She had also, prior to doing Daughters, produced some short films in her you know, career prior to Daughters. She has done films entitled Illusions, Four Women, Praise House, and A Diary of an African Nun. Please welcome to the Walker stage, Mr. Lindsay Law and Miss Julie Dash. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I thought I'd start this evening uh, before we get into Daughters of the Dust and, and Julie Dash and, and filmmaking in general for, for black Americans today in America um, with, a, with a brief history of, of, of Playhouse and how we came to meet mm -hmm. um, and how this film got to be made. American Playhouse uh, uh, is a drama series on public television. It was initially founded to counteract the fact that most drama on public television had a British accent, and uh, uh, a variety of unions representing actors, stagehands, cinematographers, musicians, um, fought with public television saying we needed our own drama series, we wanted our own artists to be working in this country, and we wanted public television to be supporting that. And American Playhouse was formed uh, primarily to then, once, once the financing was put together, to, to create work that was different than other work that was out there meaning to create work uh, that would serve underserved audiences, to bring work to television and to movie theaters that was different than all the other work, something significant, distinctive, substantive, something that had something to say. Um, most importantly, perhaps something that would outlive the lives of the people who even made it, if one is really aiming high. Um, and in the course of the last 12 years, we've made 40 feature films and approximately 150 television programs. Um, within that body of work, um, I can say um, without qualification that the most surprising work, the boldest work, the work that will indeed live beyond the lives of the filmmakers who made them, um, was work created by people working outside the mainstream. And for the most part, that has meant uh, minority filmmakers, cultural minorities, and sexual minorities. Um, the work includes films, for example, such as El Norte or Gregorio Cortez or Stand and Deliver, 
Um, Gordon Parks' film Solomon Northrop's Odyssey, um, a film of Richard Wright's novel Native Son, straight out of Brooklyn, uh, a piece we had on recently, Fires in the Mirror, uh, which gave voice to the remarkable um, actress, director, writer, anthropologist Anna DeVere Smith, um, For Us the Living, a film about Medgar Evers, um, Wayne Wang's film Eat a Bowl of Tea, um, uh, Longtime Companion, which uh, was the first film and still is the only film that has dealt with um, AIDS as it has affected the gay community in this country. In the top, I would say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, one's not supposed to have favorite children, but um, uh, so I'll say the top three or four as opposed to saying the top because that's only fair. But uh, uh, I think one of the most surprising works we were ever involved in um, and one that, that uh, uh, for which the our own sense of pride in being a part of the process. Um, and by part of the process, I mean providing a filmmaker the tools to do what he or she wants to do, not that um, we want to tell people what they should be doing, um, is a film called Daughters of the Dust. Um, is a film that uh, uh, is taught uh, in colleges and universities. It is in high school curriculums. It has been seen all over this world, uh, much less all over this country. It is a film in which everyone who told Julie she couldn't do what she wanted to do, um, she proved them wrong at every step of the way, from how to get it made, when to get it made, how to make it, how it should be released, where it should be released, who would be interested in seeing it, um, to the fact that uh, 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 the, the, the absolute bedrock of belief that she had that there was an audience for this film. Um, and I must say with great pleasure uh, that she was right uh, every step of the way. Um, it is a film that, uh, for those of you who have not seen it, it is being screened here tomorrow at 5 o'clock, um, defies um, mainstream forms of storytelling. Um, it, does it does not have a linear structure. It does not have any stars in it. It is not a contemporary urban struggle. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, it is a story about women. Um, everything I've just mentioned is on the list of everything to not put into a mainstream film today. Um, and on top of that, something that I don't even know that I was aware of at the time, um, only actually when the press pointed it out when the film was released, it was the first film um, to be released in a major manner in this country uh, by an African-American woman director, um, which is, on one hand, I suppose, a tribute to Julie that this took place. On the other hand, I must say, a great slap in the face to the entire movie business. Um, but it is, it is part of our process, uh, uh, and it has been a rewarding one, um, to work with new people, um, not just new to us, but new to the industry, first-time filmmakers, and that doesn't usually mean really first-time filmmakers. They've probably been playing in their garage or with a high eight camera or video cameras, or they've made commercials, maybe, or documentaries or industrials or something. But uh, in the back of their mind, a feature film is what they're really aiming to make. And it is uh, an enormously, um, I say, uh, I mean, selfishly, I feel like I have one of the luckiest positions, positions in the world to be able to do this. But um, um, to meet people at that stage of their career, um, in which everything is at stake, and yet nothing is at stake, um, in which you're not having to prove or live up to a reputation because you don't have one. Um, and so you can just be as bold as can be and just tell people to get out of your way um, and do what you want to do. And that's very much um, what Julie did. And it's very much uh, the result, I think, of the excellence in the film. But I thought, I'd, uh, of all the things one could become, if, if you've determined even that you want to be an artist and you want to express yourself in some way, perhaps you want to be a writer or a musician or a painter, a photographer, of all the really impossible fields to decide to be, you want to become as a filmmaker, um, primarily because the tools to execute your craft are so wildly expensive. It isn't just a matter of getting a yellow tablet and some pencils or some paint or some film and a camera. Um, it's got to be the most expensive art form there is. Um, at the same time, it probably is one of the most satisfying since, of course, it includes all those other art forms in terms of its storytelling. But I thought I'd ask Julie, um, before we met, what on earth got you, what inspired you, what made you want to become a director? 
Okay, at first I'd like to acknowledge to this audience and publicly, which I never really get a chance to do, um, what a wonderful, wonderful executive producer. Creative executive producer, Mr. Lindsay Lewis. Yes. Thank you for all of us. Because he has not only supported my work, he's also supported Nina, Nima Barnett. Remember? Yes, Hope Zora is my name. And so, so very few um, African American women do have an opportunity to do something, to have a wide broadcast or a feature film, and Mr. Law has done that for us. Okay, what made me decide to be a filmmaker? I really did not plan to be a director. I started studying film at a local filmmaking workshop in Harlem in 1968, in the way, way, way back time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was called a cinematography workshop at the time. Um, we made documentary films, newsreels. Uh, I had no idea that I would eventually want to grow up and become a director, writer, producer, etc. It just, it wasn't real to me. It was just fun making films, controlling worlds. Mm. That's it, and telling mm. stories, learning how to tell stories. At that time, um, there was no competition. You know, there was no, there was, we didn't have that same competitive edge that's out there now to make this film, make money, do this, do whatever. So it was just very enjoyable. It was something that I liked to do. Um, so I was able to build up a body of work over the years. I was able to um, major in filmmaking in an undergraduate uh, school and then later go on to the American Film Institute and at the time it was a conservatory, a two-year film conservatory. Uh, now it's the MFA program. So after I finished with AFI, um, I was able to go to UCLA to the graduate program in film there in Los Angeles and work with some fine filmmakers like Larry Clark, Charles Burnett, Haile Garima, Lele Sharon Larkin, Barbara McCullough, et cetera. And of course, that group of people, filmmakers, became known as the LA Rebellion. Um, because we made films in the belly of the beast in Hollywood, but in the shadow of Hollywood, <laughs> very combative films. Um, so I was very, very fortunate to come up in a time where we had a passion for making films. Uh, we were not competitive, and we just kind of did what we wanted to do, and I guess I became very arrogant in my own way, and and in a way very selfish too because I started making the films that I wanted to see, you know, and I still do that. I still want to make the films that I wanted to see as a child or, the, or see situations or stories told that I was not able to experience sitting on the edge of the seat in the cinema. Um, so my focus is on films about women, women of color, um, what are our issues, um, the culture of women, you know, without it um, having to be something about what society or how the outside forces affect family, friends, love relationships, etc. What happens in our intergroup relationships? That's what fascinates me. Go girl. <laughs> 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 how did how did the idea um, for the story of Daughters of the Dust evolve? It is certainly not. Um, Quite often when, when a young filmmaker has decided, uh, okay, now it's time for me to make my big splash, I've got to come up with my film, uh, they tend to be small, um, personal films related in some way perhaps to that particular filmmaker's life or experience. Um, Daughters of the Dust is, uh, uh, I suppose, I mean, epic in portions. Um, uh -huh. um, it has a large cast. It's a period film. Uh, it requires sets, costumes, um, uh, uh, it's on location as opposed to in the hometown of the filmmaker. Um, uh, in other it's words, my you, father's hometown. Uh huh. <laughs> so, so a little bit, you know. But in terms of bit. in terms of, of of the evolution of this particular story being the one that you decided, okay, this is this is going to be it. Actually, um, Daughters started out as a very small movie. It started out as a short, and it grew over the years because it took that long to get the financing together to do it, so it just kept growing and expanding and expanding, and as I grew and learned more about life, learned more about what it meant to be a mother, et cetera, then the, the story expanded. Um, I originally intended, my task for Daughters was to do, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a film that was so visual that you did not need a lot of dialogue 
to tell the story. So I originally wanted to do it as a silent film, mm -hmm. <laughs> which would not fly. Um, so after I got past that, I decided to do the film in the Gullah language because that was appropriate for this type of film. As an African American, we grow up in a in a country that's you know multicultural, multilingual. Everyone's multilingual, and we have to come to understand that we have other languages also. And so, Daughters kind of celebrates the Gullah language. Um, I know that it's difficult for many um, who watch the film, and that's why we have the subtitles early on uh, to kind of get their ear adjusted to the the sound of the Gullah dialect or language, but I think it's something that's necessary because, you know, as a child we grew up, I grew up, you know, listening to Irish American dialects, Chinese American dialects, Italian American dialects, and you learn to, you know, translate. Mm. But when it comes to, you know, African American cult culture, if it's not a southern um, dialect and everyone's saying, wait, wait, wait a minute, you know, you got to throw some subtitles, you can't do this. You know, I, I was told by many people after the film was completed that I needed to completely redub it into English, standard English, or at least a southern accent, which, which is more recognizable and acceptable. And I said, absolutely not. Thank you for not mm. <laughs> pressing me to do so. See, was it, was it uh, uh, conscious on your part in terms of how strongly you were flying in the face of convention, or was it one of the great advantages of perhaps being more naive in terms of knowing how many battles you were taking on by, by a story of this size and scope, but also supposedly in the parlance of, of the business world of movies, um, how supposedly uncommercial this idea was. Right. Well, since Daughters was, even though it was my first feature length film, it was my 11th film. Uh, I knew that I was create, and I had been trained formally in undergraduate school at the American Film Institute and at UCLA. So I knew that I was breaking almost, I was making, it was a cardinal sin <laughs> in almost every area of, of the production I was making. Because, for instance, the um, having two people narrate the story, you know, in writing, that's a cardinal sin. You cannot have two people narrating a story, only one person, the protagonist. Um, but I wanted this story told from the point of view of an unborn child. Oh, how could you do that? That child is not born yet. And, uh, and from a great grandmother. Also, the structure of the story is very different. I did not want this story told from a male, a white male Western point of view. Uh, this was a story about um, a very, very different culture, so I wanted it told from a West African point of view, and so then that's how I got into telling the story, like a griot would tell the story. The story kind of unfolds and unravels. Um, so there were so many things that, um, that I knew I was breaking the rules, but I had learned the rules, and I, it was a conscious choice mm -hmm. to break those rules. In the, in the uh, uh, I mean, it was a shocking fact to me, because I, I guess I was not aware of, of, of the fact that uh, there had not really been, at least not released on the scale that Daughters was, because Daughters um, played all over this country and uh, uh, and generated a very large box office. Mm -hmm. I had not been aware, though, until uh, uh, press reports that this was the first feature-length film released on this kind of a scale. Right, because By, Kathleen Collins right. had um, done Losing Ground. She had completed Losing Ground and um, the Cruz Brothers and Mrs. Malloy. And also, I forget the other woman's name, but she had done a feature also. But they could never, they never reached broad distribution distribution like yeah. artists did. Yeah. I mean, there has been since Leslie Harris's film, yes, um, Just Another Girl on the IRT. Mm -hmm. But do you see this, uh, um, um, I mean, in a way, it's, it's as if perhaps a dam has broken through your, through your, well, let's hope through your great efforts. But do you see, do you, are you seeing evidence of it, though, through, through your cohorts? And um, there's interest, there's, uh, but there's not a lot of follow through. There's, in, there's interest if I always call them the Hollywood Casignati, the gatekeepers, the people, you know, like at um, Columbia, Warner Brothers, let's name names, 20th century, all of that. Um, if we, as a group, African American women filmmakers, are willing to do the films that they want us to do, the films coming out of their own realities, coming out of their heads, the remakes, the retreads, you know, then um, <coughs> it'll be a lot easier for those people, but since for the most part, I, I don't 
choose to do that, that it's just as difficult as ever. Mm -hmm. It really is just as difficult. I thought we, um, um, at this point, we uh, uh, could show a bit of, um, oh. of Daughters, um, okay. especially for those of you who don't know it. Um, uh, how many people, actually, it's hard to see in here, but how many people have seen Daughters of the Dust Tour? Oh, well, <laughs> spectacular. Okay. Well, this will be a great reminder bringing the film back for you. For those who haven't, um, uh, you are indeed in for a treat. This is a film, um, Julie, Julie met uh, uh, Lynn Holst, who runs our story department. We commission scripts from writers, and there was a conference, I think it was called the Rocky Mountain Conference. Right, it was the Minority, Women's Minority Women's Retreat at Sundance. Yeah. And um, we went up there for a weekend, and I had shot a short trailer of Daughters, and I, I screened it to the audience because everyone wanted to show what they were working on, what was in their head, what kind of ideas they had. And Lynn Hulse was there, and she saw this, and she came up to me afterwards, and she said, I've never quite seen anything like this before. She said, that it's so lush, it's so sensual, it's, I love it. And I was looking at her like, <laughs> she loves it, you know. And then from there, we went into development. And uh, Yes, my big question yeah. was, I remember the time, because it was, I, I can't remember, five, eight minutes, something like mm -hmm. that in length. But I wasn't sure that anything less than $10 million could make a full-length version of, what, of the richness that we had seen. Um, and it is, uh, 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 it does... Um, incorporate, in my mind, I mean, all the elements of all the art that you could possibly have decided you might have wanted to go into in terms of the the language of it, which is what attracted me to it first. Lynn was, was extremely attracted to Julie's visual sense and what this, this short clip that Julie had shot uh, over the period of a week with a group of actors fully costumed and on location. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the language, in my mind, which is why I was so shocked at first when Julie said, gee, I really had wanted this to be silent. And I was saying, gee, it's your language that's really kind of won me over on this. Um, uh, and at that point, actually, we engaged on uh, a further draft of the script in which you did yeah. indeed enlarge many of the, the areas of, of language and storytelling. But why don't we um, go ahead. Do you want to set up this um, um, well, clip a little bit? Well, I believe this is um, a clip showing um, Eula Pazant, who's alone in the uh, Pazant uh, shanty, and she's kind of peeling scraps of memories, pieces of newspaper off of the walls, um, things that she'll be, she thinks that she's going to take north with her. And um, let's see. Okay. I'm not sure how we run the clip, but I'll yeah. just say let's run the clip and see if it happens. There it is. That was a hard one to introduce. <laughs> it's so many different ideas. This is, I mean, the, the richness of, of, of um, I mean, I'm, I mean, the film, to me, succeeds on so many levels, but I mean, the richness of the interconnection of all these different women's lives and the sense of family um, in this film, um, uh, and the richness and the diversity within that family, um, um, and those who are angry with one another um, and pleased with one another and afraid of one another, and the different beliefs and myths within these family members. Um, um, one of the things the film is able to incorporate are the enormous number of beliefs um, of the different family members, um, from from Bilal to yeah. Viola to, to Nana's beliefs in the right, ancient myths. Right, exactly. And, uh, it just shows the diversity of the uh, the African American community, and you don't see that very often. It's like either we all come from you know Christian Baptist religion, when actually we have we were influenced and informed by not only Christianity but Islam and other West African religions and deities. Did the the as you saw this film, I mean, the, the, the film, uh, I mean, it never had, I mean, we've arrived at this stage where the film has, uh, is now indeed a classic and has been extremely well received, but there were certainly um, dark moments where, where the film, upon being completed, um, and literally dripping wet from the lab, um, was indeed invited to the Sundance Film Festival, which is an extremely prestigious film festival, but also one in terms of where the, the business of, of filmmaking uh, uh, has also, to a large degree, taken over there. I mean, meaning every agent and every distributor in the world now hangs out at Sundance to snap up the newest filmmaker. And, uh, uh, and Daughters screened there, and we thought, indeed, the way would be easy from there on um, once the film made its premiere, which was, indeed, um, an extremely successful premiere. And uh, uh, AJ, the cinematographer, won the award for Best Cinematography for this film. And yet it was many, many, many months. Um, I mean, another 10 months, I yeah, think. Yeah, it was about 9 to 10 uh, months before um, 
we could um, get distribution for it because every major and minor distribution company and studio turned it down, even as a completed film. They just insisted that there was indeed no audience for it. Um, they were not interested in it, and they didn't think anyone else would be interested in it. Um, Kino International, who finally did pick it up for distribution, saw it as a, fine, uh, as a foreign film because they, most of their work is um, that they distribute as foreign films. And they saw it as a foreign film, and I liked that idea because I said, yeah, it is a foreign film. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so different from mainstream America, it's foreign. And so <laughs> we went from there. <laughs> we had, I mean, uh, 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 we had kind of split up you know, who knew who and, and taking this film around trying to, to sell it to people I had worked with or people Julie met with. Um, in terms of the people I met with, uh, uh, everyone who said no to me without exception was a white executive. Were there any, were there, was there anyone in, at that time, in sufficient authority to pick up the film who wasn't white? Do you um, remember? Yes. Um, they could have um, at least pushed it or pushed, pushed it, within and those were like some of the uh, execs at Columbia University and Warner Brothers, and they too said that, um, oh, I love it, love it, love it, it reminds me of my grandmother, it makes me cry, but um, Columbia would never put out a film like this. Because one, one, one of the battles facing all of us who, who would like to see the diversity in our movie theaters greatly increased is that it literally is a handful of people who determine what this country wants to see. Uh, they determine what the taste of the audience is. Um, and it they was have a very, very myopic view. And very. They, and they don't of their travel. their own experience only. You know, they don't travel outside of their own Hollywood community, and that's why I call them the gatekeepers, the Hollywood Cosignati, because, you know, yeah. it's, they're a, it's just like an in-group thing. I saw, you know, I saw um, Anna DeVere Smith's piece last night in Los okay. Angeles. On the, uh, She does a piece where she interviews uh, she interviewed an enormous number of people who were in, uh, uh, who were witnesses to participants in um, the riots in Los Angeles of a year ago, and she she interviews these people and she takes their words verbatim. She edits it, but it's verbatim their words, and she performs it on stage. And she got to a talent agent, um, uh, and it was a talent agent's point of view of the Los Angeles riots. <laughs> it was Very let me tell you, it was something to behold, um, uh, uh, frightening, but. Uh, uh, do, do you see the, the, the New Line Cinema, for example? Um, it's as if suddenly people woke up one morning, uh, and I don't know which film experience it was, which audience suddenly showed up, uh, that suddenly decided they call it um, um, niche marketing, um, <laughs> yeah. but that realized that suddenly there was an enormous audience in this country that was not necessarily white, um, mm -hmm. and that stories that spoke to those audiences, be they Asian, Latina, uh, uh, black, uh, uh, gay, uh, uh, wanted to see movies about themselves, um, which has to some degree uh, increased the degree of, of vitality on our screens, um, but still in a, in, a, in a minor way. Julie and I were talking before we came out here, one of the great um, uh, difficulties can be, you, you think, and we all, all have heard in the press writes about the stories of how you get your first film made, um, uh, and we've all heard the many, many stories uh, uh, of you know the, charging it all on your American Express card, or borrowing from mom and dad, or uh, or Maddie Rich, who uh, we're going to talk a bit about later. Uh, uh, you know, going on a black radio station and just getting strangers to put up money, whatever. The the the, the story that is not told so often is how uh, how do you make your second film, and does it get any easier? Um, uh, Julie is probably tripping across the answer to this just now. I, I was shocked by the answer only because I thought after we made our first three or four, it would become easy for us. Um, and I find it from our point of view to be every bit, if not more, difficult uh, exactly. each time. And I wondered how you're uh, since daughters, and, and obviously you've gotten a good deal of attention, but what your experience is like Well, now? I'm invited to lunch now and <laughs> everyone wants to take a meeting with me because they want to meet me, and uh, after they've met me they call my agent and say, oh, we just love her, love her, love her, but um, can she tell a story? Because they don't see Daughters of the Dust as, as a story, because Frankly, they don't understand it, or it's, it's not about their concerns. And so, still, even though it did very well at the so box mean, office, it's like, it's, our it's story. like, can she tell our story? Yes. And Charles Burnett, who did um, To Sleep with Anger, he was having pretty much the same problem. Mm. You know, we talk regularly about it, and um, 
they would love to take him, take his talent, and uh, get him to write their stories to rewrite. And uh, on one story, I did, he, he, told, he had to tell the producers, well, uh, um, this was done in 1972, you know, this as a black exploitation, why should I do it now? Is there also a difference, though, because you, uh, uh, for example, Matty Rich, who, uh, 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 I'm going to talk a bit about his film, Straight Out of Brooklyn, in a minute, but um, has just started filming, um, which is why he couldn't be with us here this evening, but he's just started filming uh, a new film. But after, again, for him, nearly two years of, of, I guess, bursting on the scene with the same kind of promotion and publicity uh, and, and excitement on the part of, of the press and the critics about his work. Um, but is it, is it easier? Uh, I suppose this is a naive question, mm-hmm. but I'll ask it. Is it easier for the, for, for the men? I think it is. I think it is easy, not just um, for men, but young men. Because um, right now, the media likes to profile young, urban, African-American men. Um, so that's why it's harder for Charles Burnett and um, Robert Gardner, Charles Lane, after he's done his film with Disney. He can't get another film. Uh, myself. Um, yes, this is, this is, I mean, it's, it's an aspect. We don't fit the profile. Yeah, it's an aspect. Um, um, it's an aspect of Hollywood that actually, it's one of the few that um, crosses all color lines, actually, though that particular mm-hmm. one. I mean, it, it, it's, it is a, it's an industry that, that wants that which is brand new right mm-hmm. now. Um, uh, when your film is open, trendy. Yeah. When your film is opened and you're being written about, right then and there they want to. Um, if you don't have a script that they want then and there, a year later, mm-hmm. you're not quite today's news. There was a, the New York Times Magazine, for example, the year that Straight Outta Brooklyn um, opened was also the same year The Boys in the Hood opened, and uh, uh, it was the same year as uh, um, Spike's um, Jungle Fever, uh, Jungle Fever mm-hmm. opened. Mm-hmm. And uh, the cover and Daughters, of, too. And Daughters, also. And, and the cover <laughs> story of the New York Times Magazine was uh, uh, African-American filmmakers. Hollywood's got to have And it was, mm-hmm. eight, it was eight male mm-hmm. uh, directors. <laughs> But it was also eight male directors under the age of whatever, 30 right. something, because there were also that year there were films by Michael Schultz, had a right. feature film, mm-hmm. but Michael Duke, Schultz yeah. is 48 mm-hmm. or, or thereabouts. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So it's, it, that aspect of it works against everybody, mm-hmm. uh, uh, although it's. Yeah, I still Charles find Burnett was not on the cover either. The guys, yeah. The yeah. Guy, yeah. But Bill it's the guys Duke. look after the guys, I find so often too, though, and I wonder mm-hmm. who's, who's looking out for, for you uh, mm-hmm. uh, in those studios. The, the Maddie was a um, uh, Maddie Rich came to, to filmmaking I think out of necessity um, um, which can be certainly one way of finding your career um, he was lived for a period of time in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn which is a, a, a an extremely violent and, and poverty stricken area um, he was fortunate in that his mother uh, was able to move the family out of that project uh, but when he lived there and while he lived there, he witnessed things that stayed with him forever and wanted to tell what he saw. Went to NYU film school um, for, I must say, a very brief period of time. I notice on his resume, it just mentions he attended NYU film school. It doesn't mention that he left shortly thereafter because, uh, 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 like so many film schools uh, uh, have not yet grown accustomed to, the really interesting people are the ones who don't follow all the rules. Mm-hmm. You don't want a filmmaker to be following rules, but so Maddie wasn't following rules, so he left shortly thereafter. Um, he went on a black-owned radio station in New York City uh, for an hour, talked about his script, talked about the story he wanted to tell. Um, it was about family, but it's uh, 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 certainly the other side of, of Daughters of the Dust. It's a, a, a contemporary family um, living in extreme poverty, um, it is a picture of a family much more familiar through news coverage, late night exploitation news um, uh, for the most part. Uh, and he went on this radio station and said he wanted to tell a film about his experiences, about his people, uh, and would the audience listening to that program help him? And if they would help him, could they come to such and such an address on such and such a date? And they did, and they met him, and he raised about $75,000 that way and started filming. Um, he got through a good deal of the filming uh, uh, and many of these people saw that this young man really was following through on what he had said to them he was, I forgot to mention, I think that he was 19 Um, and he uh, was able to for the most part finish shooting the film Um, 
he was editing in, there's a building in New York, the Brill Building, which was famous at one time in the 30s and 40s as the center for all of pop music. Um, it's now where most film editing and post-production facilities in New York are available. And it's one of the great uh, uh, kind of buildings to go to when you go uh, to work on a movie because you run into everybody. Every New Yorker making a movie is in that building. Now, Matty just happened to get a deal because he had a producer friend who, you know, was able to get him in at night and it was a little corner, you know, janitor's closet and they had an editing room and he started putting it together. And down the hall, uh, a rather nice person came up and introduced himself and wanted to see what he was doing. And he showed him a bit of it. And uh, the guy introduced himself and said his name was Jonathan Demi. And uh, uh, Maddie said, thank you, good to meet you, and sent him on his way. Um, luckily, the producer later informed Maddie who Jonathan Demi was. He was editing Silence of the Lamb down the hall. Um, and he quickly invited him back and said, help, help, I need help. Um, and Jonathan had worked uh, with us on a television project a number of years ago and said, well, I suggest you call the folks at American Playhouse and showed us a, I guess, about a 100-minute film um, that he wanted to lock, uh, meaning he wanted that to be the finished movie, other than he needed money to complete post-production, meaning adding the sound effects, the score, things like that. And we met at length, and, and I didn't want to interfere with what he wanted to do. At the same time, I wanted to know, might he shoot additional scenes, and might he want to have a conversation about the film, or did he really just want the money? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not particularly fond of just being a bank um, and like to have a partnership uh, with the filmmakers that we're working with. And yet Matty also had been brought up uh, in such a way that uh, he later told me that being in a room with what he considered to be a white businessman was one of the most uncomfortable moments in his entire life. Um, and over a period of time, uh, uh, we became enormously comfortable with one another. And he shot for about an additional week um, and uh, uh, had a good long time to finish editing his film. And uh, uh, we took that film also um, to Sundance, uh, where uh, the Goldwyn Company ended up in a bidding war with a variety of other companies on this film. It's a, it's a family film also. I must say it is, it is, it is um, um, for those of you who have seen it, it is um, devastating um, as opposed to inspiring, although I suppose out of devastation it can inspire you to action, but it is not, um, it leaves you, I think, numb uh, uh, and that shock value was its strength in terms of bringing home to a great many people who want to pretend this isn't going on, um, that these stories are out there and these are real. And what he was able to do was to tell it in a very small, spare style. Uh, it is not sophisticated in its filmmaking or its camera techniques or in its editing. Um, it's only sophisticated in how bold and bald um, the truthfulness of his story is. In the clip we're going to show... Um, the story revolves around a family. Um, there's a father who had dreamt of being a musician and now pumps gas, drinks too much, and beats his wife, um, which she understands. Um, and he has two children. Uh, he has a son and a daughter um, who, again, dream of more. Uh, from the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, you can look across the East River and see the great big buildings of Manhattan. And in the, build and in the movie, the young man says, you don't really think all of them did it right the right way, do you? Um, and what he decides to do to get his family out of Brooklyn, unfortunately, um, is to rob a drug dealer, um, which, of course, brings down devastation and death on his family. In the clip we're going to show, it's the father having come home um, late at night, having had too much to drink, um, railing at the universe for the situation he's in. There's a... Um, I suppose it... Well, trend, I suppose you'd say, at the moment in terms of, I mean, for the past several years, actually, um, and I at times wonder at its derivation, and, and, and all the more so how how much more of a miracle it becomes to me, the Daughters of the Dust, not just that it got made, but that it got out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the past two weeks, um, uh, two young filmmakers, um, twins, um, the Hughes brothers, um, have a film out that is uh, uh, evidently, and I've not seen. Menace to Society. Uh, uh, Menace to Society, which has uh, been enormously successful and extremely well reviewed, um, in which they've Very been good led. Film. Yeah. Yes. It's an incredible film, yes. Uh, they've been led to, uh, in, in the interviews is all I've read, in terms of, of, of trying to uh, basically preach against violence, in which they have a film that doesn't celebrate violence, but nonetheless is extremely violent. Um, yes, it's very realistic and it does not in any way glorify um, the shootings and the deaths. In fact, it's very horrible. It shows it in a very, very almost documentary fashion and it's just 
it's depressing as hell, but it's it's reality as it is, you know. Do you do you suppose? I mean, that that film. I mean, again, it was a low budget film, so perhaps there are people more willing to gamble on low budget work. Um, and yet, I find at the moment that that some of the most uh, striking and most original films have been coming both from either uh, uh, the black community of filmmakers or the gay community of filmmakers in terms of people either um, um, angry or who have been kept out of this particular system um, and yet have a richness of stories to tell and suddenly in ways more diverse than other filmmakers um, uh, have been demonstrating a talent that frankly in, in many ways is way above all the other films out there, not just that the stories are necessarily richer, but that the methods of telling the stories are breaking conventions that people of much greater reputation, meaning people who can get any movie made if they just say I want to do X or Y, mm -hmm. um, and yet are making them in such traditional methods. Is that is that just from being kept out of the ball game for so long, do you suppose? Um, partially, and, and I just think it's the independent spirit you know, it's it's partial frustration and rage, but it's also um, independent filmmakers um, have an original voice. We have something to say. We're not trying to just make money. We're trying to change the world in some small way, um, answer some questions, um, what have you it's not just a thing about making a blockbuster with a lot of stars in it and and having mm. a, a soundtrack album that comes out to accompany it there's much more to it it's it's a whole way of life it's um it's art plus it's education plus it's uh it's a way to do good and to do well you know it's very satisfying mm -hmm. do the um um there are, there are in, in many other countries, um, actually most other countries, there are enormous amounts of, of film subsidy money available to that particular country's filmmakers. Um, these film subsidy, subsidies have been set up because American films cover about 80% of the movie screens in all of those countries and they're trying to protect their native <laughs> filmmaking. They're trying to protect their uh, uh, indigenous filmmakers. Um, in this country, since we are the capital of movie making, um, um, we make more movies than any other country in the world. Uh, of course, our government doesn't see any need to subsidize films. Why should we? It's the largest. It's the second largest export in the United States is filmed entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, unfortunately, um, other than a handful of tiny grants, which occasionally come from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts, um, this is not a country that has necessarily embraced, uh, on a national level, the independent film movement. Um, uh, much less any 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 groups within that independent film movement or any individual voices. Um, I think that's partially due to um, in this country it's seen as an industry mm -hmm. rather and not an than art. Uh, rather than an art form or or a vehicle to express different views. Mm. It's just it's very much an industry like um, out of Detroit, you know, Motor Works, mm -hmm. you know, and it's about making a profit. You know, it, it, by any means necessary. <laughs> so, do you, for your second film, um, say uh, uh, take what you've learned and adjust, or do you just uh, put your head down and just keep struggling well, and fighting? There are some small adjustments that I will make, and one of those uh, would be that I will get a name actor, and that will make it easier for mm -hmm. a distributor to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I will get someone. Um, to walk through <laughs> that has a name, you know. Um, um, but uh, pretty much, I, I think I'm, I'm more at it, I have more of an advantage than perhaps, say, Hollywood producers or directors because I know how to make a film like Daughters of the Dust. It looks like, you know, five million or whatever for mm -hmm. 800,000 plus. Right, huh? right. And they keep asking, how did you do that? How did you, it, was, it, it wasn't easy, <laughs> but it's possible. But it is, it is a, one is, one is indeed uh, fighting with a community that not only, only wants to make movies that, of stories that they're familiar with, but um, unlike almost any other industry in the world, the people who run this industry have no idea how to make movies, <laughs> um, which yeah, becomes a, a rather tricky thing when you're suddenly out in the field making a movie and a bunch of people are sending you notes saying, we want more coverage, give us more close-ups. <laughs> it is interesting in that way in terms of the challenges that face uh, any filmmaker, no matter what kind of story you're, you're, you're telling. Um, 
Can you talk at all about what what is on your mind next in terms of stories you want to tell oh. or the next one you want to tell? Or? Oh yeah, I have a whole notebook full of them. Um, there's one <laughs> <laughs> that's called Good, Enemy. Thank God. <laughs> Um, my blockbuster, Enemy of the Sun. It's a love story, kind of a cross between, um, a black love story, a cross between um, uh, David Mamet's House of Games and, uh, <laughs> and, and Body Heat. <laughs> That's the way you have to describe it when you're you know, pitching the story. <laughs> it takes place in Atlanta and the Caribbean. That's one. Okay, starring Denzel Washington, right. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then there's a, there's a smaller piece, um, and actually it would be a remake of a French film, La Latrice, right. The Reader. It's about a young woman with a marvelous um, singing voice who um, is tired of working as, you know, a girly, dancing as a girly in video hip-hop movie, um, music videos, and she decides to use her angelic voice um, in a very creative, innovative way, and so she hires herself out as a reader of fine literature, and in that way, she could read passages from, you know, Toni Morrison, Ter Terry McMillan, Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, and and while she's doing so, she's also learning the power of words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The the stories. The stories, obviously, that, that are attracting you and that you want to go ahead with um, are black stories. Oh, yeah. Um, About black women specifically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are indeed filmmakers who suddenly think, well, I just want to make movies, and why, uh -uh. why should I be kept within a particular area of, of knowledge or expertise or desire? But I've is, gotten a lot of um, letters, and people are saying, why are you confining yourself to making <laughs> films <laughs> <laughs> about... Um, just focusing on um, black women and black women's issues, and it's like confining. The, it, I mean, it's wide there's open. so many other people <laughs> in the field trying to do the same, right? Right. I mean, there's so many stories to be told. There's so, so many issues to explore. I mean, I always say I want to see a, a, a story about a black woman or a, a trapeze artist. I mean, it, things that you don't even think about you, because people say, well, black women can't fly on a trapeze. It's like, why not? Mm. You know? Mm. Things like that. I want to see us in a rocket ship going to the moon. I want to see us doing everything and dealing with our own problems and our desires and our hopes and dreams, all of that. Mm. See, see, one of the, um, um, I suppose, watershed uh, 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 family pieces uh, was written uh, by Lorraine Hansberry, watershed, I should say, in the theater, um, uh, moving again to a, a, another piece, again, about a, a very different kind of story but again, a, a family story, um, one that many people in this day uh, think is an old-fashioned play, um, but we revived, uh, uh, revived it with, with director Bill Duke. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry wrote A Raisin in the Sun, I believe, I'm going to get the dates, exact dates wrong, but it was in the mid-1950s. And again, in terms of, of, of sorry, did someone? 58, thank you. Uh, and again, in that particular time, it was the first, uh, play on Broadway, um, not just by uh, a, a black, uh, a, 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 a woman, uh, uh, sorry, uh, no, getting it backwards, not only the first Broadway play by an African American artist, but a female also, mm -hmm. she, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and it was, it ran for a number of years, it brought um, Diana Sands, uh, Sidney Poitier, any number of, of performers um, to, to, uh, to everyone else's attention. It was a piece in which um, a mother, uh, a family, the father has just died, and the one gift he's left behind to this family is an insurance check. The son in the family, um, which was initial, originally played by Sidney Poitier, Danny Glover plays it in this production, the son wants to take that money and become a partner in a liquor store. Um, the daughter in this family wants to take that money and go to uh, medical college. The mother, played by Esther Roll, instead takes that check and goes and puts a down payment down on a house in an all-white neighborhood. Um, and the conflicts that arise from this decision is what fuels that play uh, and what teaches that young man um, his manhood. Um, and in its day and age was uh, a, a real rocker, I must say. The movie was um, um, a good deal tamer, frankly, than the play. Um, the movie, I'm forgetting who directed it, it was a white director, very famous at the time. Um, they took out a great many, actually before it opened on Broadway, 
Um, Lorraine was asked to take out many of the African influences in it. There had been a dance uh, in it in which the uh, uh, brother and sister put a, 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 a record on, and, and uh, I mean, these are, I mean, subtle. I mean, it wasn't, uh, 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 it was very subtle things that were removed, nonetheless were very real and strong, and, and uh, uh, I must say, shocking reasons when you look back on it now. But, um, and the movie only went farther in that direction and tried just to take out all those um, very specific details and again try and put just one face on this, on this black family so that we could think of, of, of everyone as just this one family. Um, but um, Bill Duke directed this for television. Um, I'm trying to what, what year it was. I believe we did it in 1988 or 89. Sorry, I don't have the exact date. Um, it was a great uh, uh, joy, I must say, watching Esther Roll and, uh, and Danny Glover approach these two extremely famous parts. Um, and this clip, um, the clip here is, yeah, Esther Roll and Danny Glover. Uh, uh, arguing over this money and the importance of money. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and roll that. It's interesting, when we were um, first deciding to revive that, uh, many people thought it was very old-fashioned since it was from the 50s. Um, and it's interesting to, uh, uh, to look at it again, uh, uh, to look at all of these projects again. Um, one of the great advantages um, on public television is, is, is fulfilling that role where that, uh, that many theaters in this country also do, which is to revive um, the classic works of our literature um, from generation to generation. Oh, and this is Bill Duke. Oh. <laughs> I was just stalling. Hello. Bill, how are you? Uh, I have to do technology here. I hope I don't blow it. I have to hit switches um, to get you to talk to this uh, audience here. But we've just indeed uh, finished watching um, Esther and Danny. Uh, it was the scene where uh, uh, Danny is explaining, uh, holding the check and explaining to his mother what he could do with that money. And she's saying, it used to once be about freedom, and now I see you're equating life with money. It's a great scene. And it's, uh, uh, we were just talking about the value of reviving these works uh, and how actually much that has to say today, although some people have said to us that that was an old-fashioned play. Yeah. I thought it. I'm going to switch you. I have to for you to talk to this group here for them to hear you. I should say, I have to switch buttons, so it's going to be like you know over and out, Roger, and things like that. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, we're at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and I'd say there's uh, uh, 200 people here. <laughs> um, we've been sitting with Julie Dash watching Daughters of the Dust, and we've just watched a bit of Maddie Rich's Straight Out of Brooklyn, and uh, we've explained that you're on the set with Whoopi Goldberg, um, making your new movie. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch you over uh, uh, and just ask you to talk a bit about what attracted you to doing this particular revival. Um, and as opposed to my con constantly interrupting you um, with this switch to go back and forth. And then you might talk a bit about, because what Julie and I have been talking about are the opportunities uh, today um, for African-American filmmakers. And you've seen a great deal of change through time, first as an actor and, and now as an actor and director. Uh, uh, how those are different today. Um, than when you first started out as an actor uh, and how your career has evolved through, through these enormous changes. But let me switch you over so that you can talk because all they're hearing is me at the moment. They're not hearing you at all. So uh, let's first talk about Raisin um, and why you'd wanted to do that and, and, and the importance of that um, um, today, actually. So here we go. Now can you, I think we can hear you if you speak. Are you there, Bill? Uh, are you there? Okay, when I switch it, you just start talking, because I can't talk to you while I switch it over, evidently. Uh, just in terms of talking about Raisin and what... what, what exactly, so see they're hearing this very one-sided. Sorry. Um, but mostly, I think, about the changing opportunities in terms of, I mean, you're just working all the time now. Um, and uh, we were talking a bit about the Hughes, Hughes brothers and their new films, and in terms of the opportunities out there for African-American directors. I, uh, uh, I will when you stop talking, in other words, because it's, it's not very, it's not a sophisticated technology here. Uh, uh, so when I switch it on, you'll talk, and when you stop talking, I'll switch and talk to you again, okay? So just keep going, actually. Go on a roll. <laughs> here we go. Uh, okay, go ahead. Well, so much for modern technology. Um, first of all, I, uh, um, 
want to say I want to thank you for uh, allowing me and having me uh, with you this uh, evening. I'm assuming this evening is still light out here in California, but um, thank you. And um, uh, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, American Playhouse and uh, PBS generally. Uh, I sincerely feel that it was not for uh, Lindsay Law and American Playhouse and and PBS that um, the opportunities um, that I am being afforded now, um, I would not have been afforded. Um, and i um, uh, very thankful that um, I got a, an opportunity to work on material with that, which I would never have been able to work on on a network television. And um, because of the depth of the material and the quality of actors that I was able to work with, um, raising his son Danny Glover and Esther Rolls, a lot of Dupois, and people like that. And also working uh, on a classic, which Raisin and the Sun uh, most certainly is. Uh, I know that many people feel that it is a dated play, and when I directed it, um, people felt that also. I uh, very strongly disagree with that because I think the universal uh, principles that um, that run through the play and the writing in general is classic, and I. And I think that uh, it's going to be a piece that um, uh, lasts much longer than any of us, uh, um, you know, uh, that exist here now um, are going to be around. Um, Do you think, oh, sorry, I cut you off. Um, I didn't know if you suddenly wanted me to cut you off for a sec. But I was going to talk, because we had we'd also, I'm, I'm, and I'm telling this, them this at the same time, the audience, because we hadn't gotten to discussing this yet. But Bill had also directed with us um, the meeting, right. um, which was a, a, a fictional supposition of a meeting between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, um, which we actually reran this past year when, when Malcolm X uh, opened in theaters. Um, and in addition to that, he had directed The Killing Floor for us earlier. But do you, with, with the... the the success at the moment of, of, of a wide variety of uh, male and female uh, African American directors. Do you see the the range of work uh, and material that, that you might be able to to take on or, or get people to finance? Do you see that increasing uh, uh, in terms of, of, of our theaters having a wider diversity of of experience and characters, stories, and lives being illuminated on our screens? I'm going to switch you on now to talk. Go ahead. Uh, I. I I quite honestly, um, I think that there is uh, some degree of improvement in terms of the diversity of topics that uh, minority or black directors uh, are allowed to uh, deal with. But unfortunately, uh, my feeling is, is that there are far too uh, few. And what must, almost, what must always be remembered is that this is a very, very a very, very, very much a business, and those those factors are are studios basically, in terms of it being a business, um, are not willing to take very many risks, um, and if they think that um, your subject matter is not um, palatable enough for a large cross section of audience which means that if you are not offending anyone, um, they have a greater uh, uh, opportunity to, um, to uh, recoup the investment that they've made in the film because more people will come and see it. Um, so there's, there's certain limitations in terms of what they will um, produce and distribute. And as long as that exists, uh, I think black and minority filmmakers are going to still be under the, the auspices of an industry that really thinks of the box office rather than diversity in terms of uh, subject matter in the film. Do you suppose, has there ever been, um, I mean, in much the same way back in the 20s when, when three actors, um, Mary Pickford and, and Douglas Fairbanks, and I'm forgetting who the third one was, but to fight the okay. industry as they saw it and what mm -hmm. they didn't like in those days, um, they formed their own film company. Has there ever been, or, or have you ever been a part of conversations in which, um, I mean, there's an enormous uh, number of, 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 of writers, directors, actors, w many with enormous clout um, from the African-American community in Los Angeles. Has there ever been a thought of, of, of trying to 
pool resources and form form a group that literally specifically focused in on African American work? Uh, I'm going to switch you back on now. Go ahead. Yes, I think that those conversations uh, have existed long before you know I or any of the contemporary filmmakers that are colleagues of mine uh, were ever on the scene. I'm sure that those things were talked about in the 20s, the 30s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, 90s. The issue fundamentally. The issue fundamentally is this, that it's not, a one, it's not a problem in terms of the creation of the product. I think that monies can be found to um, create product, uh, to get the actors together, to get the directors together, and the staff and crew to actually create, you know, film product. The fundamental issues in terms of the problems is in the area of distribution, uh, an exhibition. Uh, there are a number of films that have been made um, and completed projects that have not had the opportunity of distribution. Not only minorities, but black films, but uh, films that you know distributors feel uh, will not get them uh, their investment back in the box. I mean, from the box office quickly enough or as efficiently enough uh, you know, in terms of their judgment of how efficiently or quickly it should be done. So. You know, it's not enough simply to have a great idea and have the ability to um, create a film product. You have to understand that marketing, uh, distribution, and exhibition, exhibition being the actual ownership of theaters where these films are shown, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> you have to have some understanding of that also. The um, um yeah, Julie and I had been, we, we, she was saying the same thing to me, which was that, I mean, basically the, 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 the fundamental problem in this country is that filmmaking is seen as an industry and not as an art, um, uh, and, an art that has the possibility of teaching and healing and, and all of that. So I suppose, I suppose we've blown it somehow, haven't we? <laughs> um, oh, sorry, let me switch you back on. Sorry. <laughs> I was suddenly listening to you fascinated. I forgot to switch the switch. Just a sec. Hello? My belief is that we have to be uh, multi-talented in this sense, um, although I think many of us, including myself, would like to do nothing other than to create um, film ideas and to execute them um, to the best of our abilities. Um, today it does not seem to be enough because if you do not have a good business head, a good sense of business, uh, and understand like the new technologies that are existing and how they impact us, both positively and negatively, if we don't understand truly um, what the uh, new arenas of distribution are, if we do not understand what these 50 new, um, uh, or now they're talking about 1,500 new um, uh, channels that are going to be available for television of viewers in the next uh, couple of years and what it means in terms of product that we can create and opportunities in terms of distribution and product, then we're not going to be able to survive because that information is essential to our survival. There was a time, I think, if you were a great filmmaker, I mean, as an artist, uh, there's a possibility for our survival to be based upon that. But we have to be as astute in business and, the, and the, changing, the changing of the business as we are in terms of the creation of our film product. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's, and, and that's, that's. He's talking about the pay-per-view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And does that then take, uh, uh, in terms of, I mean, the skills that you thought that we would be required to be successful, what you're doing clearly, uh, uh, I guess then you're constantly in the learning mode of, of, of of acquiring additional skills, business skills, to be able to, to even play on this field and make it an even playing field, I suppose. Is that, is that true? I'm oh, sorry, the last, last part, I didn't hear you. In terms of, in terms of uh, a director today um, uh, who perhaps once just had to worry about being able to hone a good idea uh, uh, and bring together a good cast and have the ability to, to direct those actors truthfully, um, nowadays, conceivably, that director needs not only all those skills, how to make a good film and tell a good story, but also how to maneuver his or her career through the shoals of an extremely complicated financial um, um, situation. 
Well, there's no, there's no uh, uh, doubt about it. I mean, we are, you know, you have to be in a very astute business person. You cannot depend upon your attorney or your agent or your lawyer to, you know, help you through this morass and labyrinth of complexities uh, in terms of the business of it. It's like a on-the-job training. Um, it is an extremely difficult uh, process to understand and to learn. Um, and as a result, um, you make mistakes and you, you, you learn from those mistakes, hopefully, and you go on to make new mistakes. One of the things that I think is essential for us to begin to understand as minority or black filmmakers is that we, although black film and black subject matter uh, is certainly something we should be focusing on, at the same time, we have to expand our awareness. And I'm not saying this is fair or correct, but I'm saying what I would hate to see happen is the same thing that happened to us in the 70s. Uh, you know, we had those so-called black exploitation films. And what happened essentially was that fundamentally, we, uh, when those films, so-called black exploitation films, no longer uh, were needed, Black filmmakers, black producers, black writers, and black actors disappeared from the scene. And then there was talk about us uh, separating um, uh, from that industry and creating our own. I personally don't think that that's necessary. I think that minorities uh, contribute uh, a great percentage of the uh, national box office uh, growth in terms of the studios. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have a right to participate fully on the business level in terms of this industry. And I think we simply have to understand the name of the game and how it's played, and we have to begin to understand more fully how we can participate and be a part of this industry rather than being separate from it and utilize it for our benefit as well for the, as for the benefit of the industry and for the entire nation. Mm, yeah. Well, that's, um, um, I know you're, you're, you're on long shooting days there, so I just, uh, uh, we wanted to, to thank you for joining us tonight and, and bringing your uh, uh, view of, of this entire uh, uh, situation in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, filmmaking today uh, and the opportunities available. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity that you gave me in terms of, uh, if it wasn't for, say, American Playhouse, um, giving me a shot at uh, more quality uh, level of production, I would not have gotten my first feature film. And so I want to thank you for that. And I just want to say, um, Julie, um, I continue to be an admirer of yours. And uh, God bless you and uh, the best of luck. And uh, looking forward to your next projects also. And uh, thank you all for having me there. Thanks very thank much. You. <laughs> really good Thanks. I'll talk to you soon, OK? Good luck to you. Bye-bye. Well. Technology. It really was going back 20 years. Um, we thought uh, maybe we might, although I can't, it's hard to see in here, but we thought we might open it up a bit here for, for oh, that, there That's it is. Better, um, yeah. A whole group of people. Uh, <laughs> to questions um, from all of you, they're addressed to, to, to Julie or, or to myself, but mostly mm -hmm. to Julie, I would think. Um, so I guess just raise your hand and we'll oh, call. there's someone right there. What right here. Up close. Yeah, uh, oh, and speak uh, loudly, too. Probably, that'd be great. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, there was a foreign funder who um, came in with um, Playhouse as a partner, WMG, a German company, on Daughters of the Dust. And um, some other friends of mine, like Charles Burnett, um, he just recently received funding from a French, French company. company, yes. And I will probably have to go to a foreign film funder for my next film also. There's an enormous appreciation yeah. um, in the European marketplace for independent American films. Um, um, their curiosity about this country is, I must say, an enormous, is enormously greater than our curiosity about mm -hmm. them, since we'll hardly put up with foreign subtitled films, but I must say they have an enormous appetite and, and someone like a Jim Jarmusch is actually more well known outside the United States than he is here. Um, other questions? Oh no, don't be shy, there was someone back there a moment ago. Yeah, there you are. 
In terms of um, the duration of your project, it took how many years? <laughs> Um, for Daughters of the Dust, yeah. it took 15 years from the time that I first started, no, 15 years from the time that I first started writing it and seeking funding, and from the time that Playhouse came in, uh, maybe one year and 28 days to shoot it, something like that. But um, from the time that you came in um, yeah, with... It was about two, because it was almost a year of... Oh, a year of posting. A year in the editing room, yeah. Yeah, yeah. about two years of, one year developing and shooting, yeah. and one year posting and looking for... And uh, then an additional ten months, which we really never thought would take place, an additional yeah. ten months right, to, to get it into movie theaters. Yeah. Yes, here. A specific question about the Gullah dialect in your film. How did, how did the actors work with that, or did you have folks who were mostly from James Island? And oh, no. I hired a Ron Days, who's an expert on Gullah, and he was born in the region, and he's also part of a project that's translating the Bible into Gullah. Um, mm -hmm. He came on board and translated the entire script phonetically into Gullah, and then he worked with the actors doing rehearsals, and he coached them in the Gullah dialect. The older folks, for instance, I haven't seen the film yet, but the, the older woman who's weaving the basket and stuff. Oh, she's from Los Angeles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, I mean, it's, I mean they, they, yeah. they did a right. remarkable job with the right. accent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was enormous resistance, as Julie was saying, to, to to keeping it that way. I mean, I suppose we've all become, I mean, for one, enormously lazy in terms of how we, how we yeah. receive entertainment. We just want to be a passive audience. But, and what Julie came up with, which I thought was ingenious, was to, to, uh, uh, to subtitle the first few moments of the film yeah. so that you didn't feel like you were going to be lost. And then, frankly, yeah, it's, uh, uh, your ear just yeah. adjusts, and suddenly you're not aware, but it's not subtitled anymore, and you, mm -hmm. you adjust. Yes, here. Gave me so much hope as a, as a young artist. Your images. Um, what I was wondering is what for you was the most hopeful part or the most inspiring or the thing that just enriched your life. Which part? Um, Which part of the movie? The pro the whole process, whether it's meeting people or selecting people or just I just wanted to hear from you. Um, I think it's the writing. The writing is the part that I like. Well, I, there's segments of all of the writing. Sometimes the shooting would be, you know, just magical, like those sunrises with Bilal chanting. I mean, honestly, some of the crew members would start weeping because we were on the actual land where the slave ships would land and, and drop off the African captives. And some of those sunrises out there would just bring people to tears both white and black. It was just a very, very powerful type of experience. And then, of course, I always like editing, too, because then I'm back in control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's that amo amazing moment. I remember it was, mm -hmm. it was almost a full year since the movie had been shot, and, and, and you had spent a full year of looking at these images again and again and again. Um, I hadn't. I mean, I, I had flown in every now and then to see a different cut or a different version. Um, but you think it's all familiar to you again because you, you've seen it so often and then John Barnes who was the composer is that John? Yeah. John Barnes yes, yes. Um, enters the picture um, and utilizing drawing on just about every um, um, musical source that there is I mean, it's, yeah uh, he John Barnes um, we decided to um, create a kind of a new world music music that uh, some of the African captives would have heard and retained while they were being marched across the, you know, the savannas towards the... Uh ...is that, you know, and uh, so it, it's, it's remarkable. And that was another thing. Uh, no one in this country would, no recording studio would buy the, uh, the rights to do the, the music as CDs or, or as a cassette, but they will be doing it in Japan. <laughs> you know. One of the, the, the uh, and audiences, I mean, you can perceive this, though you may not know the reason how or why, but I mean, you know, what distinguishes one movie from another movie? Um, why does one movie last and another not? Um, 
there is uh, there isn't a single um, uh, uh, unintentional element in this mm. movie. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the point of exactly what you were just saying in terms of John, for example, as a small uh, a small mm -hmm. point, but indeed he he picked astrological signs for these characters and then found a key that matched that. And I mean, mm -hmm. everything in this movie, although audiences may not pick up on every little right. detail, but I mean the accumulation of those details uh, uh, and that going back to research that Julie had done or going back to just emotions or stories or whatever that, that she had known or experienced. I mean, all of that is what indeed enriches a movie and enriches your experience while making that movie and the people around you and it in, 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 in affects them. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what becomes special in terms of, of making an independent film. That's what becomes special when you're making that movie because you've got to make that movie, not because, gee, isn't movie making fun and they're paying me a lot of money. <laughs> um, and sometimes when you're, you're not sure, which, why does that movie feel so different than the other movies I'm seeing? More often than not, that's the reason why. Yes, here. Uh, yes, the movie was obviously an artistic success. Um, I'm wondering how did you measure its commercial success if you can do that? Well, I always, I mean, what would be I always say uh, the, <laughs> the box office tells you whether it was a commercial success or not. And uh, this particular film ran nine months straight in New, New York, and it broke all house records in the theater that it played in, in, was it D.C.? Or in no? D.C. Yeah, in D.C. And uh, it did very well in Philly. So it was just... It generated, it generated a couple of million dollars in this country. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, it's just opening it's then. It's just starting and to it's open It'll there. start in September in the United Kingdom and in Japan. And so... And you're going to Rio, I hear, with this uh, film? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. They had to torture her to get her to degree go to go to Rio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to state just in the commercial part, um, when you're making a film and you're thinking about the artistic part, um, do you have any idea how you're going to sort of make it a, a box office set commercial? I don't really think in terms of audience that much. Like I said earlier, I'm kind of a selfish filmmaker. <laughs> Since I'm an independent filmmaker, I'm making a film that I want to see. Um, I'm addressing my needs. Um, then I think about the audience a little bit, and I say, what do African-American women want to see when I want to see like that? But I don't sit down and say, OK, I'm going to do this because you know this is when the audience is going to really hoot, or let me throw this in because it's artsy and it's you know it'll go well in the arts community. I don't think you could make a film like that, you know, kind of piecemeal. I just think you just have to make the film that's inside of you. Make the, to, you just have to tell a story in a very different way. And what I always try to do is kind of rupture reality a little bit, try to shake people up and see the world in a whole new way, see the same uh, type of situation or story that you perhaps have seen before or heard before, the folktale or whatever, dialogue, but to see it in a new way. Breaking the rules. Yes. Uh, and, and then we were, we were talking there to the gentleman on the phone, he was simply saying, so that you would not have a repeat of the second. Mm -hmm. for, for those out there who want to start to make a film, uh, how would they, let's put it this way, after you listen to all the people, the descriptions who objected to the film, what would you say one has to do in order to get to that point so they can become independent, to make what they want? Rather than you say, am I going to be my only customer, or I'm going to, you know? I think, I think in on on certain level, you do have to be willing to say, I might be my only customer. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, what 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 mm -hmm. um, what you were calling earlier, uh, uh, which can be a, well, it's an accurate word, but at first mm -hmm. I was misunderstanding it. But um, um, the arrogance of a filmmaker is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to me, completely necessary. Um, I mean, there's a, a certain selfishness required to uh, just go ahead and make it because frankly nobody knows what elements can be put together to make a successful movie. Now a lot of people think they know and they try to tell you what elements to put in your movie to make it successful but since they don't know any better than you know you might as well do what you want to do because right, when they're exactly. wrong and you fail on their terms then you're really right. then, I mean, then, you, then, then what did you just spend two years doing? Nothing. Yes. Well, I think it's the individual instructors uh, included 
in their curriculums. For instance, sometimes it's history, sometimes it's women's studies, sometimes it's African American studies, and sometimes it's linguistics, anthropology, folklore. It fits into so many different categories that uh, you know to be studied. Yes, here. I just wanted to thank you for the film. I know that when I saw it, I took a, a there was a sigh of relief when I said, "Oh, thank God, here's someone who I felt understood me um, and my history and the black women that I have in my family." Um, I appreciated the fact that my existence as an African American woman was not um, totally defined by anger mm -hmm. or by men. Mm -hmm. Even though they're, or by being a victim. Or a victim, mm -hmm. but those are integral parts of our existence, and they were in the film in, in very subtle ways. Mm -hmm. um, so the film, for the first time, I went to a film that I felt that I was understood and celebrated. Exactly. And being a native New York, I know the Back to Brooklyn. I know that. That's a story I know. Historically, um, even yeah, I grew up in a project too. Right. Yeah. Historically, my York. people are from. Um, John's and Jamie Island, Charleston. But I don't know a lot about the Gullah and all of that. So it was a new area of um, exploration, I mm -hmm. think, um, for African Americans, for all people, that we, we need to continue uh, to explore. There's so many stories so yet untold. I yeah. just your um, interest and, and willingness to Thank celebrate you. us. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, here. Have you been able to screen your film in any African film festivals, like, such as Ouagadougou? Um, I believe it may have screened in Ouagadougou, um, but it'll just start, um, it's going to be distributed in Africa sometime in 94. It's been picked up for distribution there by a company. Yes, they can be read. One of Bill Duke's last statements concerned not working outside of Hollywood or eventually working within the film industry structure. My question is, if that structure is basically flawed and if it isn't set up or the intention there is not to work with you and to work with people who do film, quality films like Daughters of the Dust, then I personally don't see anything wrong in going outside of that industry and doing what you have to do to get it done. And one of the other gentlemen raised a point about getting investors from other countries. To me, it sounds like if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. And eventually, perhaps people in Los Angeles will wake up, but if they don't, they don't. I'm surprised to hear that, considering that your film has been successful financially and just period, that you haven't been able to get a lot of backers and to get a lot of support from the film industry. I have tons of questions that I want to ask. <laughs> and the other thing is, when you, you, you mentioned jokingly that you would have to go to Washington walk across the stage or do something just to get people in the audience, do the known actors or have any of the known actors in the industry come to yes. help you or assist you? Denzel Washington call. He and his wife love the film. He took his family to see it. Wesley Snipes, he and Wesley Snipes and oh, so many other people. They've called and said, anytime you want to do anything, I'm here for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is, a um, um, again, a handful of, of, of actors um, who can get movies made. Um, and the responsibility sometimes on them is, is enormous. I, I only remember learning that because Whoopi Goldberg has been somebody who, um, I mean, she has one kind of career in which, you know, the movies mm -hmm. that she continues making, but meanwhile, her name is enormously valuable, and she attaches it uh, uh, to a wide variety of material, some of which, I mean, most of which has just not gotten made, mm -hmm. but um, with the hope that by virtue of attaching her name to it, that would be sufficient to get it made, and in many cases, it's it not, still hasn't it's been not, no. um, <laughs> as successful as we think she is. Yes, in the back there, in the blue shirt, I think. Okay, um, most of the speaking actors were professional actors and I had worked with them before or I had um, either directing them or working as a crew member with them 
on other um, independent films. I wanted, in this particular film, I wanted to use a lot of the actors who had supported the whole new wave of African-American independent films like Charles Burnett's film, Spike Lee's films. If you're familiar with them in Charles Lane's and Robert Gardner's, et cetera, you'll see the same actors in, in Daughters of the Dust. Um, they were trained, we had to train them to use the Gullah dialect. Now, a lot of the children, all of the children and a lot of the elders were locals. And they were from, they were from the region. Yes, down here in front. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, what filmmakers and or films have influenced you when you were growing up, and even though you didn't intend to be filming when you were younger, but when you were in college as well. Oh, it varies. You would like to know what films influenced me. I would, across the board, I would just say films that ruptured my reality, films that confused me, and most of those were foreign films. Those are the films that I remember. Those are the films that had uh, made the most impression on me. For instance, Black Orpheus. I saw that as a child on The Late Show. It was dubbed, but I knew they weren't speaking English. Something was up. I didn't know what it was, but it was something was up. But you know, my mother got us up because so rarely did we see, this was in the 50s, so rarely did you see black people on television. She woke us up so we could see Black Orpheus. It's a uh, Brazilian film. Um, Fellini's Eight and a Half. I didn't know what the hell was going on, so I remembered it. Um, films that confused me, disturbed me, provoked me, whatever, were the ones that inspired me the most. One last question. Uh, here. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, as someone who works in the public television system, I'm extremely proud to know um, that that we're embracing this, this type of creative richness. <coughs> but I would, in, in, in a time when you turn on network and all you see are movies of the week that reflect the news of last week, it tells me that there is a, we have to begin to nurture our young people, develop outreach systems, inreach systems, so that we can keep this movement rich and vibrant with talent, so that we can begin to see movies of the week reflect our richness. I mean, we just have to do it. So I would like to ask Mr. Law, as far as um, American Playhouse, which is great, are there any formal outreach, um, um, career development, training, embracing young talent so that we can keep this movement very strong? And before you answer that question, I like to say, I love Denzel. I love that you introduced a variety of our, our talent and, and a variety of black women's beauty and that we come and maybe shade that was what was just exciting for me. So Mr. Long, what are some are there any formal types of programs within American Playhouse? There are, um, um, there are two different kinds of outreach that maybe you're referring to. There's one that we've become involved in recently. Um, um, it was not it was not um, in, in place when Daughters of the Dust uh, was broadcast, um, which is basically a, a company we work with and that has been financed by a variety of different companies and corporations to do outreach so that when our programs go on the air, they don't go unnoticed. Um, and so that children in schools, so that um, teachers, depending on the film, uh, 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 are aware of the subject matters and how it might relate to their, to their classrooms. Um, Fires in the Mirror, for example, um, uh, which was dealing with the, the the riots in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, but also dealt with language, also dealt with oral history, also dealt with uh, uh, c conflict resolution, um, those areas of subject matter, uh, uh, preparing materials, sending it out to schools, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, and libraries. In terms of career development, um, no, I must say we don't. Um, um, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has had, I don't know if they presently have, um, it was, I must say, enormously limited, but they did have a, 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 a limited number of internships. Uh, uh, it was a paid internship and, and uh, uh, a variety of different people who were chosen, uh, you applied, uh, uh, were placed within the public television system and the public radio system across the country. Um, and I remember we had two different people come and work at our company. Uh, I must say it was it was minorities and female, uh, uh, interestingly, and I, I ended up thinking that 
to a large extent, actually, it wasn't women per se that was were having trouble getting a job in the in the in the industry. It was it was women of color who were having trouble, and asked them actually to focus only on that. But I didn't win. So of course, one of the interns we got was actually a very talented and skillful. Um, white woman who I thought, well, this is great, but um, I don't know why she was going to have any trouble getting a job. But uh, anyway, um, uh, we had two different interns over a period of three years. I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't know if that program still does exist. Um, public television has been concerned that it's developed a variety of talents within its system, and once they get to a certain level of expertise, of course, they go and work elsewhere. Um, and uh, to a large degree, we kept saying, well, that's that's fine. The job is to keep continue the ability for turnover. For every year, there to be new, exciting people coming in, until they can get to a level where they can they can choose any job that they want. Um, and I suppose my only I mean, I'm not involved in this particular area, and I, I can only assume that due to the uh, enormously uh, and rather boringly familiar area of it, public television being completely underfinanced, this has not been a program that has been continued on a very large scale. Um, well, thank you all. Um, for being with us this evening. Thank you.